Welcome back to Blurry Creatures, the Mega Man. You got to do an episode with the D.O., Derek Olson, right? Right there, Luke? Dude, triple digits. Look at, dude, <laughs> episode 101. 101. Dude, with, with, hey, M squared, Megalithic Marvels. That's right. Dude, the legend. He almost stayed out in Egypt. We got we got him back. Got him out of Instagram prison. Got him back from Egypt. <laughs> he, That's he's right. Here. <laughs> he's wearing a Blurry Creatures tee, guys. I really am, and I'll, I'll put the uh, camera down if this is ever on video so people can see proof that I am wearing Blurry Creatures yeah. officially representing the best then, podcast out there. Oh, you're just being, you're just, you say that to all the all the, the cute boys on the shows out there, huh? <laughs> that, is, that is the wrong show for that. <laughs> I have got a lot of friends and family that are big fans of this show now and not not because I'm ever on just because I've said hey you should check out blurry creatures and they get hooked man mm. talking about uh just such a an array a plethora of subjects we love it man it's been wild it's been a great great you know two coming on two years 100 episodes you're one-on-one we love having you on man because we talk a lot about the golden age we talk a lot about the blurry creatures who built the the dynasties and it's one of the main things we have proof for that these giants or cyclops or whatever they were were building these anomalies that you know you can go put your hands on and you went down the nile and put your hands on them baby and we want to hear about it i did and and i i got to tell you guys one of the best experiences of my life was literally floating down the nile in this open air luxury lot yacht Sipping Turkish coffee <laughs> in a hammock with a gentle you're running, breeze. You're rubbing it in now, Derek. A gentle breeze bl- literally blowing over you, and you're looking out at ancient ruins along the cliffs. It was incredible. Dang. If you ever go to Egypt, you got to go on a Nile River cruise. Did you have a plate of hummus and some Mediterranean olives? <laughs> Seriously, we did. Uh, oh. Again, this was probably the favorite part of my of our trip. Because uh, so we got this special deal through our tour guide, Muhammad, with this this yacht. A lot of tours on the, are on giant boats that mm-hmm. are not open air. But the, this had the rooms downstairs. And then up, up above was, you know, this coffee bar and cots. It was amazing. So uh, it was an amazing Damn. trip for people who have never experienced Cairo traffic. That in, ex- in itself is a lifetime experience. Cairo, I think, has 20 million plus people in it. It's literally like ants on top of each other. And so getting from the airport when you arrive to your hotel, going through Cairo traffic, you've never experienced anything like it. It makes LA traffic. (laughs) I'm guessing it's just like buses and scooters and bikes and everything's just going wild. An occasional donkey with, you know, pulling somebody (laughs) I mean, and it's literally all every man for himself, uh, oh yeah. no no rules at all. But the craziest thing is, is it's like symbiotic beauty. Like you would think and within five minutes you'd see one hundred car crashes and a couple deaths. I didn't see one, not one fender meter. It's like everybody flexes and flows with everybody, mm. but you think you're gonna get hit every second. That's awesome. I I, I spent uh, uh about a week in Kabul, Afghanistan in 2017 and and driving in Kabul, I imagine was pretty much the same. It's like, there are no lanes. If you have two lanes, you've got four wide and everybody is somehow they don't get in wrecks, but everybody is moving. It's like a three man weave in basketball, Nate. Like everybody's just kind of going, going in front of each other. But I want to catch people up case in case you're, you're tuning in now, Derek, uh, went to Egypt with megalithic marbles almost, almost two weeks in February of this year. And so we've been waiting to kind of catch up and and unpack some of the things that he that he discovered but he took a a tour through megalithic marvels which is his which is his project his site and you guys really went to kind of just said he went to ground zero in a lot of ways for the people who understand you know megaliths i know we talk about gebeli tepe and these other places that may be older but the iconic idea of megaliths or maybe the image the idea of the image that, that comes up is it has to be you know giza and and the pyramids and and we're excited to have you back and kind of unpack some of the things you saw and, and Nate was right like we were we talk a lot about about on this show about the the hidden the mystery the un 
the untold history. And I love these episodes because I love history, but I love to unpack the alternate history that we're not taught, the things that, and the evidence for things that run counter to the narrative that we're fed. And Egypt is really that place. There's so many um, enigmas there, I feel like, when you're looking at, at, at the record that's in stone. And, you know, and it, it's not unlike the things that we, that we have in, in, I feel like in, in just mainstream culture, there's this mainstream narrative that's pushed and someone's in control of that narrative. And there's the, you know, there's an Egyptology, there's people in Egypt, there's a state run Egyptology department that kind of pushes their, their preferred narrative. So I'm excited about this. I, I think Nate, one of the things we talk about is the, is technology and the transaction we talk about tra- for technology that happened on Mount Hermon, right? In Genesis six, where we live with our podcast and I know that we're going to talk a little bit about ancient technology and sort of the, the evidence for that uh, that stuff because you know if we're to surmise and Alberino we talked to Tim about this that that perhaps the washers showed up in ships and with the UFO disclosure right I mean we're just connecting all the dots here I, I love this because we're going forward <laughs> Let's do and backward a hundred episode recap yeah we're just doing it all here uh, you know just the, the big guy the big guy's out there he's a he's sand colored he's still hiding. And things probably desert. probably were blurry for you, Derek, but then you go there and everything comes into focus, right? You get oh, to see boy. it firsthand. <laughs> Luke's about to be a dad. I've been dad for a while, so dad jokes are... Uh, That's good. They just flow like wine. Tell yeah. us, what's it like putting your hands yeah. on the stone, seeing them? It was incredible. It literally was the trip of a lifetime. I think most of these tours are no more than 12 days. Ours was 16. And so literally it was like a megalithic Marvel's buffet. Mm. Um, (laughs) I mean, you're seeing two, three, sometimes four sites a day. Like by the end of the day, you're, you're hiking and climbing way more than you think a lot, a lot of times in the heat. And so you're just beat by the end of the day. And a little bit, unfortunately for me, you know, one of my main objectives was to capture as much content as possible, especially video for Instagram reels and stuff. And so mm. I probably wasn't in the present like I wanted to be, you know, in a perfect world. A lot of people were just sitting there and they're getting to hear Muhammad, our tour guide, lecture at, 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 at different spots. And I'm just running around trying to capture this and that. So mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. literally was blurry. It was a blur, man, but it was amazing. <laughs> uh, Luke, you mentioned. Uh, you know, kind of uh, the mainstream cover up a little bit there. And, and a lot of listeners to your show are familiar with, you know, the fact that mainstream history has taught us to believe that ancient times equal primitive times, right? That the further you look back, um, the more archaic the ancients were, the dumber we were. But we know, I mean, one trip to Egypt will uh, unequivocally prove that that is not the case. It's the opposite, Mm. that the further we look back, the more advanced the ancients were, that they had technology to build stuff that we cannot replicate today with our greatest technologies. How do you walk amongst all these what's left over and have that opinion? How do you how do you not see what you've seen and and think that, I mean, do, do people just see this stuff and then automatically in their mind and their heart, they think this is, there's no way that human beings could build this without advanced mathematics and all the other things that go through your mind. I mean, I just wonder, is it just because a lot of people haven't seen it and that's why these terrible theories continue to barrel on decade after decade? Yeah, exactly. Most people have not been to Egypt and literally not only seen this stuff, because you can go there and see this stuff and still be blind, but mm. it's going there with somewhat of an open mind to look at the evidence. And uh, that's what we're going to get in today. I mean, I sent you guys uh, a bunch of pictures. Yeah. One example is uh, on one of the last day of, days of our tour, we went to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. There's all kinds of artifacts in there. Again, where it gets confusing is you're going to have dynastic stuff. And then you're going to have megalithic stuff mixed in, right? Mm -hmm. And mainstream Egyptology tells us, well, the dynastics just built all this. And for for listeners, can you tell us what dynastic versus megalithic means really quick? Yes. Great question. So Egyptology kind of calls them the pharaonic dynasties, you know, the pharaohs, uh, whether that was Tut or Khufu 
or Khafre. These guys all lived about 3,200 BC to 300 BC. So that kind of gives you the time frame of the dynasties, 3,200 to 300 BC. Mainstream Egyptology tells us that they created the pyramids as tombs and that everything you see in Egypt that's cool was made by them. And um, before the dynasties, they call it the pre-dynastic period, um, which they say was really just a bunch of primitive people walking around. Mm. So, but when you get to Egypt, you realize there's a whole lot more going on. So at the Egyptian museum, again, you'll see really cool. And, and I want to start off by saying the dynastic Egyptians were amazing. What they built was incredible. And so when I allude to the megalithic, that's not to down the, the dynastic Egyptians, um, it's just looking at the facts and the evidence that there is something as cool as the dynastic stuff is, there's something far greater. Again, for mm. example, at this uh, Egyptian museum in Cairo, you see all these artifacts. And uh, But again, once you go to Egypt, and if you have a guide like Muhammad Ibrahim, or you come with megalithic marvels, it's like you put on your megalithic goggles, and you start to see the stuff that jumps out in contrast to the inferior stuff. So like mm. at that museum is uh, this probably a 50 ton rectangle granite box. I sent you guys two pictures. Yeah, I'm looking at it. And if you look at the left side, you can see this ancient megalithic architect literally had some kind of saw where he was literally shearing off that side. And then he stopped for some reason. Mm. And you can see from the top down, it is a precision, almost laser looking cut. Right. So the problem is the dynastics mm-hmm. could not have done this because according to the archaeological record, they had uh, copper chisels and hammers. And copper is a much softer uh, material than rose granite, which is the hardest, most pristine type of granite. It's got a bunch of quartz in there. And so copper can't cut through quartz. Number one, and number two, a chisel and a hammer can't make such a precise cut like that, right? Without chisel marks, right? Without, like you would see, yeah, like like the shaping. It's like it, it, like if you see a sculpture that's been mm. chiseled, and it's usually not. It's not out of rose granite. I find this fascinating because I know we talked about this before, but it's like you have to have in in our terms of technology, you would have had to have like a, a diamond a diamond tip saw. Like a huge one. saw, a, a huge big one. one. I'm looking at this. You would you would need like a five foot one. Yeah, and what's amazing is if you walked around. If I showed you a picture of the other side of that, yeah. So when you walk around to the right side of that 50 ton megalithic stone, literally the inside is cut out in a perfect rectangle. So the inside is all taken out, and you know how they did it by looking at the left side which shows the evidence of this ancient tool, right? They literally were able to cut it with ease. So they didn't need blunt force. Like you said, Luke, blunt force would have showed chisel marks and Mm. all kinds of stress. This is, you know, you're not seeing stress. So do you think, Derek, because that's because they, the dynastic still had some leftover tech from the golden age? You know, they, I do believe the dynastics had uh, remnants of some knowledge of the lost technology. Okay. But if they had it all, they would have most likely made everything or at least a lot more like that stone box. Um, Because what we see is you go to all these uh, megalithic temples or these dynastic temples, and you'll see the majority of the site, 75% at least, is made of of dynastic sandstone, which is much softer. Mm. All the columns and walls are made in sections. The hieroglyphs look more crude, hmm. and then you'll look around and you'll see a megalithic artifact or statue that is precision carved out of one piece, right? Hmm. So if it was the dynastics, why didn't they make everything out of mm-hmm. the superior form, right? Mm-hmm. Um, another thing to point out is you know, a lot of people talk about the king's list, and uh, this is kind of one of the main sources that Egyptology uses to get their dating. As Muhammad Ibrahim would say, 
Uh, and he's an Egyptologist as well. So this guy is very studied, uh, amazing tour guide, knows the region, grew up there, has been doing tours for 20 years. But he makes the point, the problem with Egyptology is that they choose to use what they want and don't want. For example, there's another King's List that's kind of a Greco, was written in the Greco-Roman times by a guy named Manitin. And he says in his King's List that the first ruler of Egypt was uh, from 36,000 BC. And Egyptologists say, well, he was just exaggerating. But then you go to, uh, there's another cool museum called the Civilization Museum in Cairo. And there we saw this skeleton um, that's carbon dated at 35,000 years old. And so it just blows your mind to know that the history in Egypt is so much more ancient uh, than we know. There's just so much there. So I can, mm. I can talk on forever, but I don't want to say too much. I know you guys got lots of questions. I mean, it, it makes you think about just like how knowledge can be lost in 100 years, you know, let alone um, even just some of the like more just old school, like people had Native Americans had, you know, things they would do when they would get sick and they would take these herbs and they had this, you know, I mean, just simple things can get lost and you just wonder like, a couple, you know, a couple hundred years can go by, and a lot of this technology gets lost. But it's like someone knew their grandpa, and they still had a remnants of it. But it just seems to slowly get worse. And we have this idea that things are getting better. But one thought I had when you were talking, Derek, is that like ancient people, did you think that like the way that modern human beings show off now? You know, we we have our Lamborghinis or whatever we do to show off. But ancient people, how do you think they showed showed off? Like, you know, you're say you're in the middle of a dynastic period I mean, you look at the ancient stuff and it's just incredible. I mean, it's going to make you feel inferior. Like, man, how are these people so much smarter than us? We have to rival them. We have to challenge them. It's, it's, it's kind of like a competition. Like our ancients were so smart. You feel stupid almost if you can't recreate or build this stuff, right? Do you think that there was some ego going on? And, and <laughs> That's great. Actually, I do. Um, And so one example I'll give you, I think I sent you guys some photos of a site called the Ram Museum. This is further, much further south than the Cairo Mm -hmm. area. This is near Luxor. And so, so on our tour, just so people can understand, we spent a couple of days uh, at first in the Cairo area, Giza, looking at the Great Pyramids. Then we went north to uh, Tanis or Tennis which is a real rare spot, several hour drive, a long drive. So a lot of people don't get to see that. That was incredible. I sent you guys some pictures from Tennis. Mm-hmm. And there are what I believe are megalithic statues and symbols. I can talk more about that. But then we went back down, jumped on a plane, flew to Luxor. And from Luxor, we got on a boat and sailed all the way down to Aswan where we saw a lot of these sites I'm, I'm about to reference. So the Ramazim was one of them down near Luxor. And mainstream Egyptology says, well, this is this the memorial temple for uh, Ramses II. He was from the 19th dynasty. So he ruled from like uh, 1300 to 1200, 13, uh, 1200 BC. And they call it, you know, the Ramazim because they say the name Ramses was first identified on some hieroglyphs glyphs around in the 1800s. And when you go to this site, you see uh, large sandstone pillars, walls, they're built in sections. You see some cool um, statues of Ramses, but you notice they're all made in sections. Um, And all this is great until you see something greater, something far more mesmerizing and I think I sent you guys pictures of this at the Ram Museum. There is a 1,000 ton solid piece of Aswan ro- uh, rose granite that is a statue made from one solid piece. Mm-hmm. It's been damaged. So all you kind of see is the piece of the neck and torso, but mm-hmm. that alone still weighs 1,000 tons. So at one point, it probably weighed 2,000 tons. Um, and so this it. stone that was used to make this one solid precision cut statue was quarried three and a half hours away by car down from Aswan. 
So that's another story. So you have this giant statue and the official uh, plaque at the entrance of the site, it actually shows a 1,000 ton block that's being moved by 11 men during a previous excavation there. So picture that, 11 men to move one ton. And we're talking about a 1,000 ton uh, statue. And Muhammad Ibrahim says he's he's seen these uh, Egyptologists working or uh, scientists, and it takes them at least two hours to move a one ton block 10 meters, right? So if you keep the calculations, it would require an astounding army of like 11,000 guys to transport this 1,000 ton megalithic statue. But if you go to the site, you see there's only space and dimension for like 200 guys to move it. So you start to kind of see all these problems, right, with the mainstream theory. And so so you see that giant statue, and then you also see this greenish uh, Ramsey's head. Did you guys see that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. This thing, if you look close, you look into its ears, you literally see what look like laser cuts, okay? So, and then you've got these incredible 3D precision crafted sunken hieroglyphs Is on the marble? shoulders of that massive statue at the base of the statue that talk about uh, it, uh, Muhammad interpreted interpreted them for us. It says like uh, chosen by the sun, son of the sun, Ramses, right? So again, the dynastic Egyptians were great, but what I think is going on here, Nate, to answer your question is they found a much older megalithic temple and site here, right? Mm-hmm. And they are blown away by this, by the power of the technology they used. And so what I think we're looking at is that, you know, that Ramses II of, of the 19th dynasty couldn't have precision carved these, again, with softer chisels and hammers made of copper. That's akin to cutting wood with a plastic knife. Mm-hmm. So what we see here happening is he probably came upon the site, took upon the name of Ramses, right? Because, again, again, this is 1300 B.C., these people are much closer to the golden age than we are today. They still have more of fragments of the lost knowledge. And so they probably knew a lot more of this Titan Ramses. So he probably took upon the name, tagged the site, you know, with his name, and then um, built around it with all the sandstone columns, walls, and other statues that are literally made in sections because they couldn't make it all out of one precision crafted section if that makes sense mm-hmm. what do you think of that yeah Dude, no i mean crazy. It, it makes sense because you know a, a, as time goes on you know you still want to feel like oh yeah we're we're still hanging on to the good old days we're still hanging on to the 80s luke you yeah. know what i mean but <laughs> but but you just can't you can't make it like grandpa made it and then it, it just becomes sort of a uh like you, i like how you said tag just tag ramsey's on there yeah, I built this stuff, you know. Um it's just fascinating to me that that you know, modern people who who have college degrees can go and look at this stuff. You know, like you said, there's not even enough s- space around these statues for 300 guys to get around to lift it. So, even if there was 10,000 guys available, you can't all get a hand on it. So, how do they move it? How do they get it up? How do, how, do, how does it get put into place or even some of the stuff just looks like wood carvings. I mean, it's so perfect. It's like they're chiseled straight out of malleable stone. It's like they 3d printed it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then what, so what you see in Egypt is you see, and this is where it's easy to get confused. Again, a lot of people, and we had to tell, help Muhammad understand that a lot of people on the West in America They've been fed a diet of history that makes them believe that, again, the pyramids were just made by the pharaohs as tombs and that the the pharaohs themselves were all buried in there. Well, you find out real quick that's not the case when you see the scale of Egypt and you realize that the Valley of the Kings is hours and hours away from the pyramids, Mm. right? And then you see where the dynastic pharaohs were buried and you see it's it's far and inferior architecture, these tombs that go into the side of a hill, than when you look at this megalithic pyramid, 
right? That's precision crafted and feels almost mechanical inside. Mm. And so that's what you see in Egypt. You see this repurposing. It's, it's kind of both and. These originally were megalithic. But yes, you had the dynastics come thousands upon thousands of years later, repurpose them, tag them. Uh, they probably did bury some of their people in them, right? Because this was the greatest structure that they could honor the fallen in, right? And so another thing to point out is I sent you guys pictures from the Aswan Quarry. Mm-hmm. And this to me was one of the greatest smoking guns of advanced tech of a megalithic civilization that predated the dynastic Egyptians as great as they were. Here's what's crazy. This is 11, I believe 11 hours by car south of the great pyramids. Okay. All of the rose granite that you see in Egypt that's in the great pyramids and in the megalithic temples came from Aswan. So again, from the pyramids in Egypt, I believe that's about 11 hours away Dang. by car. So that's a whole nother thing we can get into in a second is how, how did they get all of this 11 hours, right? Number one, how do you cut it? Yeah. How do you fashion precision? Number two, how do you move this 11 hours, right? So at as one, and how much are we talking about? How much how much stone are we talking about moving? Oh, I mean, well, for example, the Valley Temple, that whole thing is made of rose granite. And you guys will see the pictures I sent there to you of me standing with Muhammad uh, in front of the Valley Temple. It's right by the Sphinx. Mm-hmm. This is what we would call a megalithic temple. It's the same megalithic mortarless precision uh, architecture, but that whole thing is rose granite. So again, we're talking if one, you know, one stone might be a hundred tons and this thing is massive. So uh, we're talking tens of thousands, if not more tons, right? Mm-hmm. So at as one, you see the unfinished obelisk lying there mm-hmm. made of rose granite. It's like five meters long. It weighs 1200 tons. Uh, why was it never finished? Mm-hmm. Lots of people theorize, well, it's because it was cracked. And you you can see it is cracked, but it's almost finished. And Muhammad makes so many great points, Muhammad Ibrahim, our tour guide, that the crack on the top might have happened at a later date, maybe to an earthquake. Uh, But despite the crack, about 75% of it appears not to be cracked. So it could still have been removed and used as a valuable piece of material, Um, right? I'm into... Uh, construction. Um, Nate, I know you are at times. And so you don't leave valuable material behind. So why was it left? Mm. But you see, you can see in this core that more than one civilization quarried here. There's at least two distinct methods that have been used. You can see one using tools where there's scrape marks and small chisel squares. And then there's the scooping method. So again, Mm -hmm. people will see the chisel squares that the dynastics were making and they're just going to zoom up see there's dynastic chisel marks so this proves that the dynastics were here yes they were here but somebody else was here when you look at the scoop marks you guys see those pictures yeah i'm looking at it so um, a lot of people talk about the unfinished obelisk but behind it is the smaller obelisk where you can literally walk down underneath it and around. And again, this is rose granite made with a bunch of quartz, some of the hardest material on the Mohs scale of hardness. And it's been scooped out like ice cream. And the scoop marks are like about a meter wide on both sides of the obelisk. And you can see if you follow Mm -hmm. the scoop marks up in different pictures, I don't think I sent them to you, but there's literally reddish vertical lines that are on the walls that lead down into the scoops, which is like almost a sign of excessive heat, maybe from an ultrasonic type tool. So again, there's not only the mystery of how this was shaped, what was this tool that was like reaching down, scooping this granite out, but then how are they moving it all over with ease 
across Egypt. Hmm. For comparison's sake, I did a little research in 2008. Um, China made a giant industrial super crane named the Tyson, and it set the world record for heaviest weight lifted by a crane with 20,100 tons. Okay, so 2008, our greatest industrial super crane could only lift 20,000 plus tons. Hmm. How did the ancient architects move <laughs> these blocks, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it probably gets frustrating after a while, I could imagine. It's kind of like on our podcast, you know, people come on and they say, there's no evidence for Bigfoot, right? And after two years of listening to people talk about it, it's like, <laughs> I, just because you haven't looked into it doesn't mean there's no evidence. So what about you, Derek? What do you think? Like, as you're, you've been doing this for a while, and you've been pondering these questions, and you've been looking at this stuff, like, permission to get weird. What do you think? How is your thoughts on how they made this evolved? And, and moved it. And moved it. Like, like, what do you think? What's your best guess? Yeah, to, this, I, to set this up, one thing, one of my <laughs> biggest revelations from this trip was geology. Now, I'm not a geologist, but I know people who are. Mohammed Ibrahim, our tour guide, helped us realize how much geology plays such a part in this. Because so, so much of this is holistic. Um, these ancients knew how to tap into the power of the earth. And so when you look, for example, at some of the stone used to make the Great Pyramid, you know, you've got the uh, rose granite inside, which makes up like the, the the most amazing parts of the pyramid, the king's chamber, the so-called king's chamber, I should say, the so-called queen's chamber. This is all rose granite uh, from Aswan, again, 11 hours away. It contains 20 to 60% quartz. And if you start to study rose granite, it's uh, Muhammad says it's radioactive stone its ingredients can almost like send and receive waves, mm. almost like radio waves, right? Well, then covering that is limestone. When you start to study limestone, it's a uh, conductive material. It absorbs uh, mm. negative energies in pollution, and it almost plays like an electrical current for granite, right? So again, if these are tombs, which let me just state in case some listeners don't know this no hieroglyphs have ever been found in any of the great pyramids or the truly megalithic pyramids of egypt and no uh mummies have ever been found in them either hmm. right so that a lot of people it's surprising how many people don't know that so if these were just tombs why are they layering it with these specific stones that have specific properties to do specific things, mm -hmm. right? That's one thing. Uh, another thing is like walk around the outside of the Great Pyramid. On the first full day of our trip, we begin exploring around the Great Pyramid. You immediately start to see all of these anomalies. And if I lose track of my train of thought here, just pull me back, guys. But that sparked me like a lot of people don't realize they're so like caught up looking up at the pyramids. They're not looking down. And what one thing that blew my mind is the floor around the Great Pyramid. Mm -hmm. It is not just dirt or bedrock. It is a constructed stone megalithic floor. Mm -hmm. It's 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 white. Um, and I sent you guys a picture. I think there's. Yeah. There's like, I saw, an, I took a picture of an eight sided stone that looks like you're looking at a wall in Peru. It's, it's beautiful. And this is just the floor. Um, and so you've, you've got this kind of stuff going on. You keep walking around and you'll notice that in this white flooring, you'll see places where these blocks have turned into like bubbled over crystals. They call it rock crystal. Mm. And Muhammad, again, back to geology, I think that's where I was going. This was originally limestone, 
But because this limestone was exposed to so much extreme heat and pressure at one point, it literally changed its structure into rock crystal. And so it was wild to see this megalithic mortarless blocks in the floor that looked like they'd been bubbled over. And obviously it was due to extreme heat. So that points back to cataclysm, right? So geology plays a huge part in why these were made and how they were made. So, yeah, I mean, you talk about the obelisk not being finished. You talk about some of those bubbles on the, on the floor. It sounds like some, something perhaps not a flood, but a cataclysm that wasn't maybe extreme heat, like a Sodom and Gomorrah type event or something like that happened, you think? Possibly. Yeah, and maybe, um, you know, meteor, that's one of, uh, a lot of people talk about the evidence of a global cataclysm happening somewhere around 12,500 years ago. I know that can sound wild to some people, but when you kind of start looking at the dating of stuff, uh, I think we've talked about before in other episodes about the Great Sphinx and the great research done by Robert Schock. You know, again, mainstream Egyptology tells us that Khafre, uh, I believe, built the Sphinx around 2500 BC. But when you start to look closer uh, at the Sphinx and the walls around it, its enclosure, there is all kinds of water erosion. Mm. Well, this is the desert. How could that be? And so when you start looking into, as a geologist, when that much rain was, it was a long time ago, right? And so uh, Shock believes the Sphinx from the end of the last ice age, 10,000 BC. And so you start to hear those dates. Um, we know Gobekli Tepe is ancient. Graham Hancock talks about that. Um, its first stones were laid about 11,600 years ago at the end of what they call the Younger Dryas. And so... <sighs> If you look into um, what Plato wrote about Atlantis, the approximate date Plato gives us for the submergence of Atlantis, he said was 9,000 years before Solon of Greece visited Egypt. Mm. And if you do the research, that visit took place around 600 BC. So Plato mm. is telling us that Atlantis was submerged 9,600 BC, 11,600 years ago. Now, a lot of people hear Atlantis and they think, man, and that's just make-believe fairy tale stuff. But the more I research, the more I believe that was likely, um, you know, a golden age megalithic city um, or one that um, kind of was an example of the golden age. So does that answer your question, Nate? Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's it's complicated. I mean, it sounds like the golden age was a lot longer and further back, maybe 10,000. 20,000 years. It sounds like a long time. The more our show barrels on, it doesn't seem like it was a short. I think it's interesting too, in the beginning you talked about a skeleton being carbon dated and I immediately thought of the Sphinx, right? That there's all this research about what, and it didn't rain. And you know, it was a 20, it was something like 16,000 BC. The Nile Valley actually was experiencing rain. I mean, quote me if that's wrong. It's something that range where you're like, well, yeah, of course there were things there before. Like the geology speaks to, and that's why I like what you're saying. The geology actually speaks to the narrative, to the true narrative about what things were going on. And we did have an episode with the pyramid. We were talking about the pyramids with you before, previous in our, in our catalog here. And one of the things you sent over as well was the, was the idea of an energy charging station. So going to Egypt, were you more convinced now that the pyramids were some sort of energy hmm like power plant sort of mechanism that was connected to what was happening at ISIS at, at the energy charging base at ISIS and, and talk through that because we know, yeah. we, I, I think we can probably definitively say based on all the evidence and what you've set before us that they're not tombs. Like there's, there's no hieroglyphics. These, these weren't, these were repurposed that some, some dynastic King came along and said that they were, they thought they were the most important, you know, the, the pyramid of um, what is it? The uh, pyramid of Khufu, where they decide he's going to get buried in there, right? But these were these were there already, right? They're, in some ways, the effigy of these mountains, which we can take back to Genesis 6, depends on how you want to do that. But it, it appears as if these were based on, on what you're saying, conductivity, and then what we've talked about before, these were power plants. It, 
Can you talk about what, what you saw at ISIS and then what you saw in the pyramids that maybe expounded or made you think that, yeah, that could yeah, be a possibility? Hmm. Yeah, so great question, you guys. So in a nutshell, yes, I'm more convinced than ever that this is all relating to energy. You know, we live the 21st century and we're really proud. You know, we're led to believe by mainstream thought today that this is the height of civilization. We are the smartest that humans have ever been. We have cell phones, right? We um, have Teslas. Uh, but the reality is, I don't believe this is the smartest humankind has ever been. Um, so when you look at the pyramids, they had a different kind of energy, a holistic energy. An energy, they didn't need to blow stuff up to create this. They created stuff with ease. So as Muhammad would, would say, you know, you've got kind of different kind of megalithic structures in Egypt. You've got the pyramids. You've got these megalithic temples. An example of that would be the Valley Temple. You've got the obelisks. And then you've got what could almost be like engines. Think of the... Um, Osirion of Abydos. I don't know if I sent you a picture of that. So mm -hmm. let me break this down. So the pyramids, I believe, were likely producing some type of ancient holistic energy. So the pyramid, the purpose of this pyramid, think of like an ancient generator. It's powering these megalithic temples. Mm. The temples aren't as big as the pyramid, right? So the pyramid is almost like the, it's the big, big engine. And it's producing this holistic energy that's powering these megalithic temples. If you go to these megalithic temples, and I sent you guys some pictures of the Valley Temple, and there's a bunch of them, you can see these are made where they're functional for, for humans or ancient beings to walk through. Mm. The pyramid, not at all. That was one thing that blew my mind climbing into the pyramid. You know, they've got these wooden ramps with steps, mm -hmm. just me with a backpack. It was all I could do to climb up some of these 300 foot yeah. long flights or coming down was even harder. I mean, you were, you are bent over trying to climb down 300 feet. It's backbreaking, right? And this is just me. So that was one major thing that jumped out is how in the world could this have been functional for a ceremonial <laughs> burial with hundreds of people coming through with yeah. relics and statues? Yeah, it's like someone finding a Tesla to say today and, and you know, 500 years from now and say, look at this flower bed I found. You know what I mean? Like you have this, this $70,000 car and, you know, the interpretation is they must have planted flowers in this thing. You know, something, some dumb hypothesis i mean you have this it, it's obviously a tool it's obviously a giant it's a tool of some kind it's not a mansion it's not a tomb like you said you can't even get in those those videos you posted man they're claustrophobic i was just like dude i don't yeah i could yeah i was like too my i wouldn't go in there i i'd feel freaking so out, trapped man, I'm freaking out. <laughs> but yeah, it's, seriously you, it's 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 you can i mean you don't have to be a genius to realize it's a tool that's how i feel about it though no, well said. It's a tool. I mean, again, it's not even functional to walk in these chambers, the ascending chambers and the descend descending chambers. Mm -hmm. So I say that to say the megalithic temples, like the Valley Temple, you can see where this is made to walk through. And so according to Muhammad and many other well-studied people, um, these megalithic temples, again, different than the pyramids, were made so that the ancients would come and receive healing for their bodies and for fertility. Mm. And even when you read the hieroglyphs of the dynastic Egyptians, these megalithic temples were still full of power where they would come through even, you know, 3,500 years ago to, you know, fertility powers and receive healing for their bodies. Mm. And in these temples are, um, sometimes either obelisks or what I called uh, in that picture, I sent you energy charging bases, right? Mm. And so again, I'll, I'll break that down more in a second. So you've got the pyramids acting like giant engines that are powering these temples that people are coming to, to receive healing, fertility. 
And then you've got these smaller engines. If you Google Osirian of Abydos, this is one of the most incredible. It's underground, subterranean structures. And um, Muhammad is convinced that that was powering the Great Pyramids, right? So the Great Pyramids, they don't have endless power. So they're needing to be powered by these subterranean, almost machine-like structures. And again, when you look at the geology, the geology is different for the Osirian of Abydos. It, here's why. It, it's this subterranean temple with 110 megalithic pillars made of rose granite. Again, granite's like plutonic. It's very strong against natural elements. So it's almost like the ancients were trying to protect the Osirian from energy blasts. And so it's, it's likely that they were connected underground to the pyramids. So all this stuff, Muhammad was saying, oral tradition around the area from uh, the guards he talks to, is that there are, they, they find tunnels all over, ancient, giant tunnels all over underground uh, that are, of course, they're all blocked off. People, normal people can't go in them. Hmm. So it's almost like um, somehow these are connected pyramids to the temples, to the engines. And I like what author um, Chris Dunn says. He wrote the Giza power plant. Hmm. He, he believes that, the Great Pyramid was originally built to provide a highly technical society with holistic energy that is somehow harmonically coupled uh, with the earth. So I know I said a lot. Yeah. You know, it, it really brings up a good point, Derek, and what you think about, because I mean, you see, if you do any research on like guys like Tesla and even some of the early inventors, we have a monopoly on energy, Right. And if these ancient people like giants were bred in with society and people had this advanced knowledge, it would be a lot harder to have a monopoly on energy, right? I mean, you know we have better technologies than fossil fuels, and we've had it for 100 years. But because, you know, like, I mean, look at, look at what they did to Tesla. I mean, he was figuring out things with electricity that were decades and decades in the future, and they basically took him out, shut him down. And human beings have in the last, you know, 100 years have sort of cornered the market on energy. And I feel like ancient people, they probably didn't look at it like that. You probably couldn't corner the energy market because it was everywhere. It was in the, it was available. It was free. They just knew how to tap into it. I, I wonder if there's something there. There's a conversation there of, of how humans have, we manipulate things, we trade market, and then we're at the top and then nobody else can Nobody else can have any access, you know, like. Uh, well, there absolutely is a conversation um, yeah. we can have about that. So when you go to, so I, I do believe that the, the ancient, ancient original megalithic builders, I believe it was this free holistic type energy that was powering this ancient civilization. It was helping the crops grow, right? It was providing healing and fertility. Um, for these ancients. I mean, when, when you look at life today, everybody's trying to not die. Everybody's trying to live longer, right? It's all about health care. It's all about anti-aging. It was the same with the ancients. But it's interesting, Nate, you bring that up because you absolutely see this at all of these megalithic temples. And um, let me talk now about the Isis temple with the energy charging base. For example, you go to this Isis temple, you know, originally megalithic foundations, again, producing healing and energy. All of these temples now are surrounded by massive mud brick walls that are dated to the time of the dynastics. So Muhammad was literally telling us that it's like about 9,500 BC, you know, when these cataclysms were happening. The power to these, a lot of them kind of shut off, mm. but there was still, there was, you know, still limited uh, energy you could receive. And so when the dynastics arrived, they literally built these mud brick um, walls around all these healing centers because that like holds it in. 
and also it keeps people out, right? So you couldn't just come in. Mm. Only the elites or the ruling class could enjoy this or whom they deemed worthy to, right? And literally Muhammad Ibrahim talked actually quite ex- extensively about that, how in the dynastic time, it's evident, again, based on the geology and, and the, the architecture added later, how this was sealed off to the public and only used for the ruling class. Um, so Isis Temple, this was probably, in a way, it was one of my favorite sites because you're down there, again, towards Luxor, much further south of, of Giza. This is the most beautiful area of Egypt. Like the Nile River is so beautiful. Uh, all those granite rock outcroppings and palm trees are surrounding the area. And so this Isis temple is built on this incredible island in the middle of the Nile. So you can only get there by boat. And so it's quite a ride. I think I sent you a picture of it. As you're arriving by boat, you can see the dynastic uh, architecture made of sandstone. Again, it's cool. It's amazing until you see something more amazing. And so inside um, Isis Temple, and Isis, if you look at Egyptian history and Egyptology, mythology, Isis was known as a great healer, the inventor of science. And so I think Isis even means place of birth. So again, fertility, it's talking about energy, consciousness. According to Muhammad, the base floor of the sites constructed of rose granite Again, contains 20 to 60% quartz, uh, almost making it radioactive. The walls are made of sandstone, which contains like, you know, sand and salt. It's absorbing negative energy. And this is why it's, again, considered a healing center. But you walk into this, the kind of like the Holy of Holies of this temple. And you see something that really stands out. Again, it's kind of like going to Machu Picchu. You see all the Inca stonework, which is cool, but it's made of small, rough stone and clay mortar. And then you see the white granite megaliths. And you know they're two separate things. Same thing here. You walk in, you see the sandstone and the hieroglyphs and the depictions of the pharaohs, and it's awesome. And then you see, and I sent you guys the picture there. I'd love to see your take on it this megalith it almost looks like an altar it's cut straight from uh, rose granite Mm -hmm. it's got a flat top and this thing uh was most likely according to muhammad and others uh, like an energy charging base similar to maybe a lithium battery charger where the ancients would bring a um maybe a granite piece an artifact, even a statue, and they would place it on there to charge it. Again, we're talking geology. And then they would take that artifact to their other temple or to their other site in order to activate it with healing energy. We haven't really talked about cataclysm a whole lot, but whether it's Tennis um, or Elephantine Island, I mean, you'll see literally these megaton megalithic blocks. We haven't even talked about Elephantine Island yet, but we can do that in a future show. You see these, these, these megaliths literally ripped apart. It's not just like a wall toppled. Mm. They were ripped apart. You see literal like fire scorch marks on these statues. Um, And so kind of, again, alluding to what you're saying, it's, it looks like there was definitely some crazy cataclysm that hit. It doesn't look like it was just your everyday earthquake. I mean, it was fiery, hot, ripping apart of megaliths. So, so interesting to think about. I guess one of the biggest takeaways from this trip, I know, I knew going into this trip that, you know, the Pyramids were clearly, I believed, not built by the dynastics, that they were much older than 4,500 years old, as mainstream Egyptology would tell us. But I assumed that, uh, you know, most of the other stuff, save for a few megalithic temples, were all built by the dynastics. And so that was the biggest surprise. And again, I got to give credit to 
our guide, Muhammad Ibrahim, renowned Egyptologist and tour guide for really pointing out that so much of it is megalithic. You don't only have the pyramids, but you've got these megalithic temples that were made by the same builders of the pyramids. You've got these obelisks that were made by the same builders of the pyramids. And the obelisk at Karnak that is still standing, if we still have time, we'll talk about that. Incredible. But then the greatest surprise of all was that all over Egypt are these statues. You see the dynastic statues. They're cool. They're made of sandstone usually, but they're made in, in sections. But you can literally see uh, what look like megalithic statues, whether it's the one I referenced at the Ramazim that's a thousand tons, or look at the picture I sent you guys from Karnak of the torso, the waist mm -hmm. and the legs of this megalithic statue. Um, the picture doesn't even do it justice how big this thing was, but I believe what we're looking at there it literally is the torso representation of the megalithic builders that mm. blew my mind that we actually have pieces of statues. We can see that we're literally, some of them look 3d. If you look at the, the statue bust from tennis, it's got muscle tone. It looks like it's been 3d printed. You compare that to a lot of the dynastic statues and they're not the same. One is crude. One is 3d printed. Again, this torso at Karnak, these giant legs of a Titan look like they were 3D printed. You walk around the side mm -hmm. and you see muscle tone in the thighs. That was the most incredible surprise of this trip is that I believe we also have megalithic statues likely from the same builders of the pyramids.